टेक्निकल सेशन डॉक्टर सुदर्शन सुरेंद्रन हैज कंप्लीटेड इज पीजी इन ह्यूमन एनाटॉमी फ्रॉम केएमसी मैंगलोर एंड पीएचडी इन न्यूरो साइंस फ्रॉम मणिपल एकेडमी ऑफ हायर एजुकेशन ही हैज 19 इयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस इन टीचिंग सर हैज कंप्लीटेड एससीआरबी ए गवर्नमेंट फंडेड प्रोजेक्ट and currently working on multiple projects at present four doctoral candidates are working under his supervision sir has presented several papers in national and international conferences among which five have won in national five have won the best uh, presentation awards sir has published over in national and international peer reviewed journals which include education research too sir has multiple co collaborations with popular universities in india and abroad too presently is working as an associate professor in anatomy in american university of antigua college of medicine i welcome you sir thank you let me take this opportunity to introduce and welcome mo moderator of the fourth technical session Dr Meera Jacob is presently working as an associate professor in the department of anatomy in Yonopaya Medical College Bangalore madam has completed her mbbs from yonopaya medical college and md from ej institute of medical science from rajiv gandhi university she has published many articles in reputed uh, national and international peer reviewed journals she has won the best teacher award in the year 2022 from yonopaya medical college madam is presently pursuing her fellowship from st johns medical college bangalore on behalf of the institute i welcome you madam for this particular technical session Thank director dr seema eshrai stm pg center uh, i welcome you madam i would like to welcome the faculty coordinator of the conference dr joman lonappan and his team of students i welcome you all thank you last but not the least a warm welcome to all the delegates students faculty members who are virtually present and also the one who are watching this session through youtube welcome all now i request uh, the session moderator dr uh, meera madam to take over the session okay very good morning one and all i am very glad to be part of this academic feast which is the need of this century need of the hour i extend my gratitude to the director sdm pg center for management study and the organizing committee members for giving this opportunity i mentioned as academic feast because uh, i feel that we all are in the best job in the world because we get to work with people who are energetic lively creative that is our students so we are talking here not about pedagogy but mainly about andragogy adult learning because in higher education in the present century it's more about than acquiring the knowledge it's more about acquiring the higher order skills okay like critical thinking like problem solving team work and communication so gone are the days where we had a teacher centered classroom where we are all familiar with from our youth but now it is a modern pedagogy so we want we facilitate our students to handle and interpret the concepts the ideas and think as an expert so our whole idea as an educator will be to how to inspire our students how to keep their attention along my subject so we need to understand that one thing they all have choices so by choices here i mean that it's the learning the diverse learning activities that we are going to provide them based on their learning styles so here we'll present a set of innovative and evidence based pedagogical approaches that have the potential to guide our teaching practitioners and transforming our learning experiences so i'll not take too much of your time sir i welcome dr sudarshan surendran to give us an insight on innovative teaching pedagogies for world class learning over to you sir thank you very much ma'am 
Uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, is the screen visible to everyone? Yes, sir, it is yes, visible. Sir. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you everyone for inviting me and having in this session. Uh, it's really a wonderful thing to be in this session, actually. And the past two years have taught us so many innovative ways. Everybody is an innovator these days regarding the teaching online and uh, sharing the knowledge with the students and making them attentive in the online sessions. So we have I learned a lot in these two years, basically. So going on to the uh, session, uh, innovative teaching pedagogies for world-class learning. What is innovative pedagogy? Uh, pedagogy is basically just a learning method or a teaching method which is given to the students. So when you see, uh, I'm actually uh, was working as a research professor in anatomy at uh, American University of Antigua College of Medicine. And this is beautiful small island, which you can see in this picture here. So pedagogy, what does it mean basically? Uh, it's an art, uh, art, science, or uh, profession of teaching. And when you see the pedagogy, basically it's from a Greek word, where a boy or child, it is basically a uh, boy or child is led by a leader and it used to take the school and then bring them back. And that leader actually used to teach all the ways of modern uh, level, whatever the knowledge is required for a student. That is all taught by the leader. So that is where it started from. So one reason for the teacher to be called as pedagogue, it actually starts from the word pedagogue, and that's pedagogy in the recent terms. So when you see the world class leading uh, teacher education systems and all that, uh, one which comes into everyone's mind is Finland. Finland is basically the most sort of education system when you see around the world. So Finnish children, if you see, they don't start a formal education until they're seven, and they're education system basically it does not give much of homeworks and exams until the age of six where after that they are slightly started with a little bit of exams and uh, very little bit of homework and their education whole time if you see the working hours the teaching hours and the learning hours it is pretty much less compared to the other countries in the world and this starts at a very young age where the students are basically they do not have the competition or the academic pressure which actually helps them to flourish and they can Remember, they actually can learn things rather than just to know how to pass the exams. So one more education system which I really appreciate is the education system in Japan. So when you see the Japanese education system, they focus more on the quality over the quantity. So even the smallest thing they teach, they, they actually watch over the quality of it rather than the quantity of it. So when you see the OECD countries, basically the top performing countries, the ranking system, in that it is basically Japan where it's, you can see it's the literacy, mathematics and the sciences field where Japan ranks in the top list. And around 91% of the uh, times if you see this, 91% uh, of the students in, the, in Japan, if you see, they don't ignore their lectures. The lectures are considered very important and they give a lot of respect for the teachers. And it is not only the school which actually takes up the whole time of the students. They go to the after school workshops where they learn the skills which are required for the academic purpose. So academic purpose in school and the workshops which are done in the evenings all together. It is not only school education. It is also the skills which are required for the day to day activities. Everything together, mend them and get them ready for the future life. One most important thing in Japan is the punctuality. Punctuality is very much considered a very serious thing in Japan and students are very rarely late for class until unless they have a very valid reason for being late. And most of the students, if you see, they do not skip classes. They love coming out to the classes. And these things are built up from the basic small uh, kids. So Danish children, if you see, that's one more education system which is very much established and very much famous for their way of teaching. 
And these kids, if you see, they start at the age of six. They don't start before that. They start at the age of six. And the difference, the gap between the students and the teachers, it is actually very much reduced. And they go to the extent of calling their teachers by their first names. It's like even the smallest kids, they call the teachers with the first names. And these teachers, they make sure that these students not only just memorize the things, but they actually are involved in problem solving. Problem solving has become one of the most important uh, concerns in this uh, education system, basically. So education system teaches the students to have the problem solving ability. It actually helps them a lot in coming up with the day-to-day -day, uh, challenges which they come across. So education, one more important thing which about uh, Denmark, uh, preferably like this, it is from 25 to 64, the age group, if you see, these education systems, they have a continuous learning process. It is not just that they go to school and graduate and they complete their education. It is a continuous education process. And this education process, it is taken to the elders, eldermost age. So this has been encouraged by even workplaces where the employees are given additional training and the workplaces also, they are happy to pay for it, for the employees to get trained and they become better at the, whatever the profession they do. So once uh, Einstein actually uh, said that education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. This is very much true when you consider the education system. When it is up to the mark, we should consider the fact that it is just not the learning of facts. It is actually the training of the mind, which actually gets the ability to think through. So I just quote, it is not so very important for a person to learn facts. Facts can be taken from the books. So for that, he does not really need a college. He can learn them from the books. The value of an education in a liberal arts college is not the learning of many facts, but the training of the mind to think something that cannot be learned from the textbooks. So textbook knowledge, it can be taken up by anyone just by reading the textbook. So application of this textbook knowledge, how they do it, how they come up with that, how they apply to the day-to-day life activities, how they apply to the professional career, all these things are the ones which are actually concentrated more in a well-built education system. So how can we do that? <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, interactive sessions, if you see the teaching sessions that forego one-way communication, most of the times, olden days, if you see, now the systems have changed a lot, but olden days, it used to be a one-way communication strategy. And this has to be adopted by the two-way communication strategy where the students are involved. I pretty much remember in school days when we talk actually, they used to say no talking, but nowadays it is more of talking in the classrooms. They encourage the students to come up with their talking and ask the doubts. They should not be hesitant about asking questions. So if we have to promote asking questions from the student side, we have to ask them questions and distribute it to all the students. Some of the students, we have seen everybody is educated and we know that students tend to hide in the back benches and the sites. So we have to make sure that every student participates. It's just the uh, beginning or the initial hindrance which they have, which has to be broken up. And once it is broken, students will be more than happy to participate and interact in all the questions which we ask through the classes. And uh, if that becomes a challenge, if the students are still not participating, uh, we can use the games. Games basically, it's a simple thing. Uh, say, for example, uh, I'm an anatomist and we have a lot of dissections. There's a small group teachings going on. So when we have the small group teachings, in that small group, we have around 16 students. And those 16 students are again divided into two or three groups and post them with the questions and come up with the answers. So when they come up with the answer, they work together. That group teaching and the group learning activity when we do it, they actually like it and they come up with very good answers. So, and if they don't understand, ask the students to help the others. It is a peer teaching which is also involved in this. So all together they can communicate and come up with the very good answers. Uses of technology and uh, in the classroom, smart boards are very much pretty much in all the colleges they are used now. So. Smart boards with the interactive displays, they actually help a lot in the interaction between students and the faculty. So uh, relate material to your student's life. So this is one more activity which actually can be done. So relating to the everyday life activity. So uh, since it's a business management school, I thought I'll put it up here. So students' lives, basically, they need to know about what it is and how it is. So these numbers, when you see in this picture, they are basically the stock indices and the stock markets which are represented. So probably we can give them a company to be tracked. So when we give a small activity and ask them to present it on one day, what happens is they just go through it, come back, present, and then just 
probably this, forget it. When we give them a challenge to track it through a process around six months or so throughout the semester, they could come up with a really good understanding of what is happening throughout the company and what is happening with these numbers. What do these numbers mean? Each and every small aspect of the uh, these numbers, they can come up and they can understand very well. So they have to be involved in the day-to-day -day activities. Or you can give up a company name and just ask them to follow the balance sheets. They could come up with a very good understanding and they can also explain it very well to the peers. That also helps them a lot. One more thing is... Uh, Teaching. When we take teaching so seriously, students are very smart these days. They can understand our nervousness and they can very much clearly make out what we are trying to tell and what they are expected to be knowing through. So teaching has to be very casual. Casual in the sense, give them the freedom to talk. The students should understand that it's a teacher and it's not a, a kind of a person who is actually just doing the one-way talking. He is actually trying to interact with us and helping us understand the topic. So once that confidence is built up between the students and the teachers, obviously any pedagogy, any teaching method, it should work out in any classroom. So the break, the barrier between the student and the teacher, that needs to be broken down initially itself. So once that is broken, students will be more than happy to participate in the classes and the teaching sessions become very interactive. Now, the last one I would tell is the <coughs> thinking out of the box. Now we have started giving up all the in knowledge to the students and how to make them think out of the box. So that is one more challenge actually for the students. When they read from the books, when they take down their exams and finally they get the grades and they finish up all the exams, what happens then? So what? where do they apply this knowledge? So thinking out of the box actually, it is just that uh, the answers are around everywhere. So say for example, this, it was a very simple thing. Everybody knows about it. So when you see the wings of the bird, that is actually, it was the initiative for the designing the airplanes. So flights, they were designed from the birds. Any idea what is this picture? Anyone? What is the show? Anyone would like to answer that? I'm just trying to break up the monotony. This is one more thing which you can expect in a classroom. So when you ask a question, basically it's a silence where we were. So when you try to break the silence, just give them a hint. It's a train. It's a simple train. So it's a bullet train, which is actually famous in Japan. So when you see the shape of it, it is basically a train which is designed with a long nose in front of it. The initial design was not like this. The front was actually a blunt end. And this blunt end became a sharp beak-like structure that is all inspiration from this kingfisher bird. So when you see the kingfisher bird, the nose actually, the beak of it, it is so pointed and the design of it, it actually helps it in getting into the water and getting its prey without having it to actually to sprinkle the water everywhere. It doesn't uh, disturb the water at a surface and straight away it goes and gets it prey. So that design, the engineer was actually fond of birds and he saw this design in this kingfisher bird's beak and immediately he designed the front of this uh, <clears throat> front of this bullet train in this manner. So you can see the shape actually resembling the beak of a kingfisher bird. Now this was out of the box thinking. There was nothing actually like engineering which, which was strictly involved with it. If it was just a book knowledge, definitely it would have been a different design probably. So that is one way of uh, comparing things. And one more is uh, show them real uh, life scenarios. Say, for example, this is uh, one video. I just give you the link here. If you want, you can try it now. I'll just give you a minute. It is a small video, one minute video. I want you to feel it. What happens when this train actually passes through the tunnel? Why, what was the reason behind designing the long front end of the bullet trains? That was actually the sonic boom, which we call it. So when the train actually it runs through, since we uh, don't have much time, I'll just continue with that. So I've just put the link here, or you can use this keyword in this video. So the keyword, the first two videos pro should probably should uh, come up with this. So once you play that video, within the first 20 or 25 seconds, you can hear the loud boom, which actually comes in through this tunnel. And this was actually very much disturbing for the residents around this uh, tunnel place, around the hill place. So this disturbance, they had to reduce it. So the reason behind 
designing the long beak of this or long front end of this bullet trains was actually the reduction or avoiding the sonic boom which they actually see in case of the bullet trains passing through the tunnel. So whenever you have time, just go through this once. So uh, out of the box thinking, uh, sometimes we use technology and technology use, it has to be uh, properly monitored and use of technology can actually, <coughs> excuse me, this is just the jet lag which is kicking in for me. It's okay. The, when you use technology, it has to be properly monitored and one of the schools in uh, Netherlands, basically, it is actually called as the Steve Jobs schools and it is also the education for a new era, it is called O4NT, that's in Dutch, which they call it. And it is here, all the students are given the iPads. iPad is not a distraction, basically, but it is a part of the learning process. The kids, when they are young, they are given with the iPads and they are taught on how to use these resources very meaningfully. So the students, they use it properly and uh, it is more of a learning uh, process or a, a, a aiding tool rather than it's a distraction. And there is also an app which is given to the parents, which actually helps them to follow the kids and uh, parents can actually monitor them and learn how the kids are performing and also how the kids are learning their school studies. And there is also a tool in built which actually can help the students grade their achievements and keep a note of it and they can monitor themselves and their performances. This is not done online and all this happens within the school. They actually go to the school physically and they participate in the activities and with these iPads, they are performing very well. Now, proper use of digital resources, as I told you, the digital resources are so many these days. You just type in any form, any content, any app. It's like we have thousands and thousands of apps and all the distractions which are possible within the digital resources. So digital resources, they have to be used very carefully and they have to be, they have to serve the purpose of what is required in the schools basically. Uh, creativity is one more thing which actually involves the pedagogy uh, learning process. So give them the time to think and uh, present their own uh, content or whatever they feel in their own ways. So what I mean by this is when we ask the questions in the classrooms, the students basically they take a minute to think about it and then come up with an answer. It's not that they don't know the answer. They know the answer, but they're trying to make up and frame up their answers in a proper uh, proper way so that they were presented in a different or best form they are uh, capable of. So that time needs to be given. There is a small gap between the question asked and the answers provided by the students. So that is very important thing when you consider teaching. So well, give them the time gap and the students will come up with the answer. And when you wait for a response, the responses are really good. And also make sure that these students, they are distributed, the questions are distributed. Those students who are, do not participate, they have to be brought in and they have to participate in the activities. As I told you, this can be a daily activity. So ask the questions in a, such a way that the topic is related to the daily activity. And when we ask the question, they have to think about what can be applied here, where it can be taken in, and how it can be answered well. So, for example, uh, I'm an anatomist, basically. So teaching ways are uh, different things which can be taken for different students. So simple ways is like, I was surprised, basically. So when uh, the questions were asked, the arm, forearm, and the hand. So the arm, it's a huge structure. Uh, forearm is a bit small, and the hand is pretty small compared to the arm. When you see the number of muscles present, the arm has around three, and the palm has around 20. So that's a huge number. So when... The students were asked about this. The students came up with the answer. They just they had to take a minute or so and they started discussing. And when they came up with the answer, they said that the number of joints in the palm is more compared to the arm. So all that needs is a small bit of time, give them time to think and discuss with their friends. And definitely they will come up with the answer. So they need a little bit of time to come up with the answers. That's what it means. And we can also uh, take feedback in real time. This is one more interactive way of interacting with the students. So Kahoot is one platform which is very much interactive. Socrative is one which we use here. And Socrative is basically a platform where we can uh, involve the questions. And these students can take up the questions. They can uh, see the performances. We can tell them the grades. And once the grades are given, they can analyze themselves. And where the, wherever they went wrong, the peers can actually uh, com uh, come into the picture and they can help with discussion with the students. So those who have got it right, those who have got it wrong, 
they can help each other and come up with answers. And this is one of my favorites. It's Mentimeter. It's just called as Mentimeter. So it is a live scaling meter. So whatever happens in Mentimeter, what we do is we just put a question and they start responding in the app. So when they start responding, what happens is the complete response is taken up and it is presented in this word cloud. So when the word cloud is presented like this, it becomes so interactive and we can see that the highest number of response actually comes up big and the uh, whatever size which is smaller it basically means that the response numbers were very low so this word cloud actually makes it so interesting and the students really love it it could be made into a simple uh, chart which is a bar chart over here so a simple chart also can be taken up but uh, my preference i prefer this word cloud which actually is very interactive and the students just love it when it comes on the, the screen and it is live it just looks so attractive And uh, collaboration, that is one more way of uh, teaching. So when you teach the students, it's not the one way teaching, which uh, we prefer generally in these days. It is supposed to be a collaborative work. So when we tell the uh, students to collaborate, we should also provide them with a platform. So collaboration, Socrates can be uh, used again. And Twidla is one platform where actually it is just an online whiteboard. So online whiteboard where everyone can participate together and everyone can contribute to the uh, question, whatever is asked in the classroom. So Twitter is one more white, online whiteboard, basically. It's a, for collaborations. Augmented reality. So when we see, <coughs> excuse me. So augmented reality, when we see it, uh, a picture speaks better than the words. So a picture rather than a 2D picture, which is shown. So in human anatomy, basically, it is related to the medical science and the students need to understand the size and the proportion of each and every structure which is seen in the the human body so this can be well explained with the 3d atlas rather than a 2d atlas so i just put it uh, in related to my subject probably it could be related to some other subjects too and these 3d atlases are very good resources for understanding the human body so when they look at these structures the students actually love it and they start exploring all the possibilities with the 3d atlas and the understanding is really better and encouraged in these uh, websites and some of them are paid, and uh, 4D Anatomy is one more site, which is actually uh, supposed to be subscribed. And 3D Atlas is uh, still free, probably. Gamification. This is one more favorite of mine. So open ended questions, make them groups, and start scoring them. So in the classrooms, what happens is it's a huge group, and we have to divide them into small groups and provide them with the open ended questions and ask them to come up with the answers. The question should be designed in such a way that they can think. So once they start discussing, and once they start discussing, each group has to come up with their own answers. And these are very simple techniques which can be used in the classroom. So gamification, definitely these groups and scorings. So just give them an advantage of uh, something, some kind of uh, reward uh, per se. So some kind of reward for which uh, they can be rewarded for each a correct answer and they can be probably punished or say so for a wrong answer and see which group wins students actually come up and they join up with their whole team so what generally one of the basic rules which i prefer is when the student answers for one student answers from one group the same student cannot repeat uh, or say another answer in the same session so they have to take turns and every student needs to participate so when this basically what does is when a student try, uh, tries to answer the person answers and the next student who is hesitant to answer he is forced to answer he or she is forced to answer and the students who the peers which are who are next or close to them they try to help the student to come up with the answer and they just help them to give up the answer in the front of the class so that actually boosts their confidence and they start learning better and one more way is uh, generally in computer science uh, education this is uh, very probably done and this is basically a sequence of codes which uh, is run on a computer. It is given to them and they are asked to find the mistake. It can be done individually, individually or it can be done as a group depending on the size of the code. And if it is done individually, ask them and the reason has to be shown. So when they try to find the mistake, finding mistakes is very interesting. The result has to be there. So definitely the students take it as a challenge and they do very well in the uh, gamification, this kind of uh, activities. And uh, again and again, I'm involving the same sentence here. Make sure that everyone involves in discussion. So whenever there is an activity, whenever some kind of quest, quiz or any kind of game is involved in the students, make sure that all the students participate. 
when some of the students are left out, it means that the only those who are participating are actually involved and the others are basically trying to escape from there. So once they start involving themselves in the activities which are done in the classroom, definitely they will come up and they will learn so many things. And uh, they should be given the freedom to point out the mistakes. So whenever there is a mistake done, they should be able to point out it could be the faculty or the student by themselves. So mistakes should be pointed out and we should be open-minded to take it and correct it on the spot. So definitely everyone does mistakes and the open-mindedness to accept the mistakes should be present in uh, teaching basically. One more aspect of uh, teaching uh, which is very much famous and very much uh, sought of is uh, concept mapping. Concept mapping, uh, this one topic itself is a separate session by him. So when you see concept mapping, it is basically visually organizing the concepts that you learned and the topics which are being taught, all of it has to be concise and put into a concept. So this is basically a team activity. And when you do this activity, what they do is all the students, they have to be divided into groups and the topic which is taught to them, they come up with, they have to come up with a concept which actually explains the whole act, uh, topic taught to them. So concept maps, these basically when you try them, initially it may look like it is just a simple activity, but when you try to do this in a classroom setup, the students, when they try to understand and come up with these concept maps, they do wonders in this. Even if there is a small uh, error or small diversion from the topic of understanding, this can be corrected and the students can be explained that this is not the right way and the other way is the right way. So this basically gets up the understanding of the students to the teacher. We can analyze and we can evaluate the students' understanding uh, based on this concept as which, get, which they come up in the activity. This is one of the famous ways and most of the schools, they use it. And this is very good at uh, uh, analyzing the students' understanding, basically. The small group activities, when you look at the small group activities, these small group activities are the ones which are happening most of the uh, education systems in all over the world. More than having a large group in a classroom and lecturing them throughout, the small group activities actually help them. So say, for example, around 10 to 15 students can be in a small group and the students should be given a task or students could be given a multiple small tasks, say, for example, one or two hours in a stretch. And when we give up the questions to them, the students need to analyze it. And this should not be a single word or single sentence answers. They should go through the entire question. It could be a small phrase and the students have to come up with the answer after discussing with their groups. So we have the small group activities which are being conducted here. In that, we just provide them with the questions. Each question, we give them a minute or two break. So they discuss and come up with the answer. So when they come up with the answer, they are supposed to answer the questions from each of the groups. So when they do the answering, what happens is if they are wrong, if they think that the question is right, whatever the answer is they thought is right, and if they are wrong, they have to justify it. Why did they think that the answer was uh, correct? When they try to justify it and the correct answer is explained later, what happens is they understand that is the most important thing. They just don't uh, take the answer from there. They understand that this could be the possible way of going wrong and this could be the possible way of thinking if they don't know the subject and if they don't know, have the understanding of the topic thought. So this actually helps them very much. And students' feedback, when you see from these small group activities, they learn a lot from these small group activities. Uh, regarding the small group activities, the topics need to be given in uh, advance and they should be given time saying the learning objectives which they have. The learning objectives need to be given to them. And once they're given, the students need to go through the learning objectives before they come for the sessions. And in between, make sure that all the students, they participate regularly. And once they start participating, once uh, generally the rule is, one student gives one answer and the next answer should be given by someone else from the group. It should not be the same person giving the answers. <coughs> yes, me. Now, after having so many varieties of uh, innovative ways of teaching students, so many involvement techniques which can be used in the classrooms, what is the student attention time? We can have a one hour lecture, we can have a two hours lecture. So this was always a controversy. Excuse me. This was always a controversy and this has been uh, addressed through research activities through. So when you see the research articles which, which are published in uh, various journals, 
So attention in the classroom, does it extend beyond the first 10 minutes? Does it be extend beyond that first 20 minutes? So it is not the first 10 minutes or 20 minutes. If it is just the 10 minutes or 20 minutes, which our attention is there, then what is the point of going around for 50 or one hour, 50 minutes or one hour? So give them a small break in between. So 15 minutes to 20 minutes, a five minutes break where they can analyze a question related to the topic taught in the first 15 minutes, a five minutes break. These students, they start discussing and they come up with an answer. Then they go to the next topic. That five minutes actually helps them a lot and keeps their attention within the topic. There are so many articles. You can just Google it in the scholar and you can get many. So attention span during, there was a study here, eight seconds, 10 minutes or more. What is it? That is also a nice study which is done. And daydreaming, this is one more <laughs> very much uh, needs to be addressed. When you see the students, actually, we I had a, a student who used to sit in the first bench and he used to be so attentive all the time. And I also thought that he was a very sincere student and he used to address all the uh, attention part, part of it. But uh, later I came to know that it actually, he was uh, never present in the class physic. It was just the uh, physical presence, not the mental presence of it. So daydreaming, does it actually have anything to do with the education or finally the student actually if you see he was performing well maybe he was not present in the class but uh, he was performing well it was a surprise i don't know how he did that but he was good one of my favorite ways uh, is make them draw and write this is uh, again uh, scientifically proven and when you see handwriting versus typing if you see the memory performance in uh, handwriting is well more compared to the typing aspect so the more of typing, nowadays it's all laptops and the gadgets which they bring into the classroom and they can take notes, all the notebooks, digital notebooks which they have, they can just type in. But the handwriting, the physical uh, paper and the pen writing, it actually helps them very well to understand. And if you make them write, definitely it will help them. And one more way of uh, teaching is the drawing effect. So when you see drawing, drawing actually has a next level of understanding. So if they have to visually represent, if they have to present the understanding as a picture, definitely it will be a very good boost for their memory. And this is also scientifically proven in one of the channels. So uh, finally coming to the understanding uh, student learning. So we have a bunch of students in the class who are actually different and every student has a different way of uh, understanding. So. <laughs> this is one part which need, we need to keep in mind. Uh, this was a small uh, questionnaire, which basically we, uh, many of the educational systems, they used it to understand how the students actually take up the, uh, start, uh, whatever the topic is taught in the class. So these are four different ways of understanding. So one is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and uh, reading and writing. So the first letters, if you take V, A, R, and K, it is called as a VAR uh, questionnaire. So when the student answers these, this question, finally the output is given as which type of learner is a student. So once the student understands what type of learner he is, some of the students, if you see, they learn best through the charts and images and watching videos. They prefer the images which are basically <coughs> colorful. And they also have these maps. The, some of the students, they have these maps built in their mind, which actually helps them to remember most of the information which is taught in the class. Auditory learner, they prefer listening. So many of the audiobooks which are present these days, audiobooks are very great resource and it can save your uh, time. On the go, you can listen to it. And these are very much happening to these days. So learn best through the listening and depends on hearing and speaking as <coughs> main way of learning. Some of them are uh, read and write learners. Uh, say these people, they prefer writing the notes and the lecture notes and the textbook, which actually gives them a lot of information. So these students, they take up that in that way of learning. I'm sorry. So kinesthetic learners, are these are very good. Uh, this is one of the best ways of learning, actually. Kinesthetic learners, they experience, they do practically, and then they take up learning. So this is one important way. If everybody can be kinesthetic learners, they remember these aspects for a long time. So basically, practical experience is much more considered as a very uh, good way of learning compared to other ways. So, yeah. So I'll just give you an example of this. Butterscotch cake with uh, vanilla icing with lots of buttercream. So can you picture it? Everybody knows that butterscotch cake. Yes, you're familiar with it. Vanilla icing, that's also familiar to everyone. So when we put a picture over here, 
this actually gives a clear picture of what is expected of them. So the students, they need to be clear with what is expected of them, what they need to remember, and what is expected in the exams. So once that is clear for them, they make their own ways of understanding. And if the teacher and the student both have the common path, and if the barrier between the student and the teacher is broken, definitely the uh, teaching will be very much appreciated. So a uh, picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Any questions? If you have, I can take it. I hope I'm not cross time. No, sir. You are very much on time. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, sir. Thank you. It was a great, well-received session. And I personally enjoyed it because uh, we could picturize a classroom and uh, each student how to improve their attention span. Uh, we all every day we do that. <laughs> so thank you so much, sir, for sharing it. It was thank very you. much informative. Sir, we have our ed national educational policy now into place. So looking forward for some uh, innovative uh, pedagogy so that we can overcome some barriers. We I agree that we have some barriers for some creativity and innovations in India. So, sir, one your opinion regarding what about this interprofessional collaboration, sir? which can improve our educational system? Oh, that's a beautiful question, actually. So when you see interprofessional collaborations, the students, they need to understand their uh, first preferred subject. If they are, say, for example, uh, you're a doctor, so I can talk in medical terms. Mm -hmm. So if it is uh, anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, they should not see the three. I hope everyone understands this. So I'll just put it in uh, terms which I know. So when you see anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, there's three different subjects. And when you take anatomy itself, it is different systems which are involved. So until the end of the first year, the student does not know what is a human body. All they know is different parts, different organs. Every system is taught to them. And finally, when it comes to the understanding, the, all the three subjects, the exams come out. So they just finish the exams and go to the second year. And when they go to the clinical setup, when we talk to the clinicians, they say that anatomy, yes, when we ask about a liver, okay, fine, the student knows it. When the additional subject, the next step is asked, what could be the issues? Say, for example, the venous drainage of the liver. They don't understand. They don't remember that. The understanding, that part has to be brought in. So some of the medical schools, as far as I know, some I've heard that. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the names. So they, what they do is from the first year all the way till the last, they take up anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry. So that is one way. And... Uh, when you go to the second year, pathology, uh, forensic medicine, all those subjects, when they come up, they have to be linked to the day-to-day -day activities. So that can be also done. So interprofessional activities, interprofessional collaborations, definitely they are a need for this century, but it has to be taken with a uh, careful step. It cannot be just pushed in because students already, they're confused. And if we confuse them more, definitely it is going to hinder their yes. subject and uh, appreciation of the subject. So, so definitely it is uh, yes. uh, needed in the century. So it's like uh, somebody say like uh, when a student leaves the school, like they have a ton of energy and teachers are tired because. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That is what is expected. And you see uh, in Finland, for example, if you take the example in Finland, becoming a teacher is not so easy. They sc uh, they screen them so much. It takes almost, uh, I believe it's six years probably. So they take so many years before they become a teacher. So teacher profession is considered as one of the most valuable uh, areas and becoming a teacher, it actually drains the energy of controlling. When we ha say, uh, I used to tell my family actually, Controlling one kid at home is so difficult and how the teachers control 50 hundreds. That's a huge task. And when all the hundred say, I have spoken so much about open classrooms, breaking the barrier between the teacher and the student, let the students talk. Imagine one kid, two kids talking at home is so irritating and hundred kids talking at one stretch in the classroom. It is going to take your energy off. Definitely. So that is what is expected from a teacher. The barrier should be broken. The students should listen to the teacher and the students should be open to the teacher and the faculty as well. They should be open to the students. Once that barrier is broken, the understanding is so nice to see, you know, the students take it up so easily. When the five minutes break is done, that five minutes break is done. When the stu student is talking, he's talking. When the answer is expected at the end of five minutes, the student gives the answer. Then when the teachers talk, the students talk. 
once that understanding is brought in the classroom will be beautiful thank you sir thank you prashant sir any questions from the audience sir like anyone audience sir do you have any questions i think uh, some students have posted the questions let me go, yeah, go we through have it a question in the chat will gamification help the students to upskill themselves according to the industry standards yes definitely there are so many games which actually help the students nowadays creativity has so much improved in case of games uh, sometimes if you see the kindergarten kids they know better at uh, handling these tech, uh, gadgets rather than us when you give it to them they explore so many things so games definitely they can improve your understanding and uh, your preparedness for the industry standards but as far as i see if it is used with uh, control definitely they can help you but sometimes games can take you away from the normal education style which is expected of you so you need to be very careful while using these games yes. that's why i didn't uh, involve much in the games part games definitely they help uh, quizzes and grouped activities individual activities involving games they can be a distraction very easily you can get distracted one small pop up from any of the social media messages yes it's done studying is over gaming is over ready to related education and you are into different things so you need to be very careful group activities with the games definitely it will help out uh, sir uh, regarding this regarding this like simulations in teaching so in a business related mm -hmm. class we can be used like model for international trade or development of some business enterprises so that they can learn from their mistakes in a safe environment and how it is so as you go on with the process you understand better